Um, so let's open with prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the accuracy of your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together here in a free country. And I thank you for these men taking time out of their schedules to be here. I, uh, <clears throat> again, I'm just appreciative of the opportunity to share your word. It's always a privilege. We thank you for its accuracy, for the fact that it is our rule book, for the things that we can learn from it that we can practically apply in our lives. We pray for insights into your word tonight, not necessarily from what I say, um, but from what you work in these men's hearts. And I thank you again for all of your goodness to us and for tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, so we're going to look at Acts 18, um, just by way of review a little bit. Uh, we, you may remember I taught Acts 16, if you happen to have been here. Um, <clears throat> Acts 16, uh, 1526 to 1822 is Paul's second missionary journey. Okay? He travels 2,700 miles, takes about two or three years, starts, if you can see that red little laser pointer thing, he starts at Antioch, goes all the way around here. Acts 16 was in Philippi. <clears throat> And then he gets down to Acts 17, I think Nick taught, and he gets down to Amphipolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica, Berea, gets down to Athens. And then in Acts 18, he's left Athens, and he's going to go down to, down here to Corinth, okay? <clears throat> so, we're going to simply read Acts 18. We'll look at a little more detail. You have to, um, probably should have the New King James Version, wouldn't have to be, but probably should be, probably be easier. You want to read? Go ahead. Read as much as you like. If, when you want to stop, just stop. Sure. After this news, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come to live with his wife and so because Claudius and all the Jews departed from Rome, and he came to them. So to Paul's he was of the same trade. He stayed with them and worked. For by occupation they were tent makers, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled with the Spirit, testifying to the Jews that Jesus is Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by vision Do not be afraid. But speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in the city, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to judgment, seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear witness. But if it is a question of words and names and their own law, look to it yourselves. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took so King, so King, so, 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 mm -hmm. right. the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, but Galileo took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while. And then he took leave of brethren and called for ship and sailed for Syria. Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sincrea. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For he had taken a vow, and he came to Ephesus. 
Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Okay, so uh, as with any passage in Scripture that you read, I encourage you to put yourself in the situation. Um, imagine yourself being Paul or Silas is along in this trip or Timothy is along in this trip. Uh, we'll look at Timothy a little bit later. Um, but I encourage you to actually put yourself in the situation. Um, in the context of a three to, two to three year trip, 2,700 miles around this area which was essentially the Roman Empire, okay? So now we're gonna look just sort of um, piece by piece at this. First of all, Corinth, interesting place. Remember, Paul went here by choice, okay? He didn't have to go to Corinth. Nobody determined what his itinerary was gonna be. He decided what it was gonna be. But Corinth was in considerably before this, you know, this is again about 50, 49 to 51 is his second missionary journey. Several centuries before, Corinth was a 90, at 90,000 people. So it was a fair-sized city, probably larger in New Testament times. But interestingly about Corinth, and Pastor David has mentioned this when he's taught about Corinthians as well, um, there was a temple of Aphrodite. If you don't know who Aphrodite is, Aphrodite was the Greek goddess of love and pleasure, a.k.a. sex, corresponding to the Roman goddess Venus. Maybe you're more familiar with that name. You know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, that Venus. Okay, so they had a temple there, and as part of their worship, there were 1,000, count them, 1,000 temple prostitutes. That was part of the worship. That was part of Corinth, okay? <clears throat> the, uh, the lifestyle was so bad. I couldn't think of an analogy in English, but the lifestyle was so characteristic of Corinth in Corinth that the Greeks came up with a verb for that, Corinthianize. So if you were living like a Corinthian, you were Corinthianizing. They made a special word for it. It was that distinctive. And there was, I, I studied Latin in college, okay, so there was a saying in Latin. In Latin, it's non licet omnibus adira Corinthum. If you translate it, it's not permitted to everybody to get to Corinth. Not everybody gets that opportunity because you could get whatever you wanted in Corinth. As long as you had the money, no problem. You could get it in Corinth. That was what Corinth was like. And Paul, again, went there by choice. <clears throat> and the life lesson I thought about with this, of course, he went there by choice, but the life lesson I thought about this is all of us the most godless of us, the people in Corinth, or the good people, the bad people, doesn't matter. Everybody needs Christ. Um, don't be talked out of witnessing to your faith, to Christ, to the Bible, because you think they won't believe, they're too bad, they're too indifferent, they're too good, they're too this, they're too that. We get, I know that I have gotten talked out of witnessing someone about the Bible, Christ, whatever, because I have this preconceived notion about their response. So I, I sort of decide whether they're going to believe first, and then I predicate whether I'm going to talk about it on what I think their response is going to be. I encourage you not to do that. 
be more like Paul. Go to a place like Corinth. No, just kidding. <laughs> so uh, you may have, and I'll, you can look at these verses as well, um, just sort of reference them. It's in uh, verse 2. He found a certain Jew named Quilla, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Claudius Caesar was the ruler of that Roman Empire you saw. He ruled the Roman Empire from 41 to 54 AD. Okay, so in 49, he decided all the Jews were getting out of Rome because they were causing a ruckus. It occurred in 49 AD, and the reason I bring this up is Jews and Christians, there really wasn't a great distinction. So if the Jews, for example, were expelled from Rome because we don't like you guys, you're causing trouble, get out. The same opinion is going to be very much alive and well about Christians because there wasn't really a difference in the mind of most people. Christianity was a sect of Judaism. Essentially, that's what it was at this time. It was an offshoot. So if they didn't like the Jews, they didn't like the Christians either. Now, I don't know if you have heard uh, kind of, you know, in the news in this country, there is becoming what I think it would be safe to say is sort of a Christian prejudice. If you're Christian nowadays, um, there can be a prejudice that you're kind of closed-minded and traditional and or hyper um, conservative thinking. And all those come before you make any encounters. If you have the Christian label on you, you have all those prejudices that sort of precede any interaction you do with lots and lots of people. Popular culture, I think it's safe to say, is like that about Christianity. The reason, again, I bring this up is it was very much analogous to what happened here. There was a prejudice about Jews and Christians, very much so, just like there is in our country, more so then, because they didn't live in a free, democratic society. I mean, Rome was as close as you got at that point, but it wasn't free and democratic. One, uh, there was a Roman uh, historian, his name was Suetonius. He wrote a thing called Life of Claudius. This is Claudius Caesar that's referred to in Acts 18.2. <clears throat> so the quotation from his history as to why Claudius did this is, uh, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Christ, he expelled them from Rome. In other words, they didn't like the fact that people were turning to Christ, so they're causing all kinds of disturbances, like they did for Paul almost everywhere he went. They're instigating riots. They do it in Corinth. They did it in um, Thessalonica, in Berea, in Jerusalem, in Damascus. They did it almost everywhere he went. He got more persecution from Jews than he ever got from heathen. Now, he did get persecution from people who were pagan, who were worshiping idols, but most of the time, it was the Jews. In any case, that is why Claudius said, get out, just get out of Rome altogether. <clears throat> and then uh, he mentions Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, I just want to point this out because Aquila and Priscilla become wonderful believers for Paul, very supportive of him all the way to when he was imprisoned in 2 Timothy. Um, it says they were expelled, so they've left Rome. They're Jews at this point. It doesn't say they're Christians. Um, the record, Luke's record, describes Aquila as a certain Jew. So he hadn't come to Christ. Apparently that happened after Aquila and Priscilla encountered Paul. <clears throat> in Acts 18.18, 18, we see, uh, it says, So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. So they've come from Rome to Corinth, right? They got kicked out. They come to Corinth. They start going with Paul on this third missionary, or this second missionary journey. Later in Acts 18, he said, it says, So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him. That's referring to Apollos. Again, Apollos really wasn't a Christian either. You know, it says Apollos was a Jew, and it says he knows up to the baptism of John. He didn't get to the point of the baptism of Holy Spirit and of Jesus Christ. So Aquila and Priscilla take him aside and expound to him more perfectly, right? We'll talk about that a little later. That's, that is, in a way, an amazing thing just in itself. But we see that they took him aside and explained to him more perfectly what he was going to be talking about. 
In Romans 16.3, Paul writes, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Just so you have a time reference. Again, the second missionary journey, the time frame we're talking about is 49 to 51. The reference in Romans 16.3 is probably dated like 58. So a number of years later, Priscilla and Aquila are still traveling with Paul. And then they were small group leaders. I thought this was a great reference in 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Um, as a sidelight, the Christian church as a body of Christian believers for probably the first roughly 300 years primarily did not exist in churches like we think of it today. It existed in homes. It wasn't until 325 with the Council of Nicaea under Constantine that Christianity was made the official religion of the Roman Empire and they didn't have to be concerned about persecution so much if they met in a body of believers. So they met in people's homes, typically, which is why many times in the New Testament you see references to the church that is in their house, like we see here. And lastly, Aquila and Priscilla were with Paul to the end. In 2 Timothy 4.19, it says, Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Um, 2 Timothy was written probably 65, 66, something like that, just before Paul was martyred after his, during his second imprisonment in Rome. Not the one that we know of at the end of Acts, but one after that. So the life lesson from this for me is you never know how the individual you tell about Christ will respond. Again, remember, Aquila and Priscilla were not Christians when they encountered Paul. He apparently held forth Christ to them. They came to Christ. They might become the next Apostle Paul or Billy Graham. Look what Aquila and Priscilla did. They were with him, with Paul, for the next 15 years. Through thick and thin, running a home church, whatever it was, they were doing it. Okay? Even all the way to the, to the point of, of Paul being martyred. And I, I was, Billy Graham kind of comes to mind because, you know, you never know who's going to be the first thing you think of Billy Graham because he was an evangelist, right? So this guy, I remember watching him on television and watching the Crusades when I was younger. He actually was doing Crusades up until 2005. Um, but I watched him when I was a kid. My mom and dad were Christians. I was raised Christian. My mom was kind of a big fan of Billy Graham, so we would watch the Crusades. In any case, he, it is estimated that he uh, had 2.2 billion people see his Crusades and 3.2 million decisions for Christ. And then uh, lastly, relative to this life lesson, let people decide whether they're going to believe the gospel. Don't decide for them by not telling them. Again, don't predetermine. All we're supposed to do is hold forth God's word. That's all we got to do. What the response is is not up to us. It's not our responsibility. Um, in Acts 18.3, there's reference to the fact that Paul worked in the same craft that Aquila and Priscilla did, that Aquila did. They were tent makers, okay? So just the fact that Paul worked, I think, I wanted to look at that a little bit because... Um, it's significant that Paul, even in the context of all the travels we see, supported himself, worked to support himself. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we not, might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Now, let me give you a little context. Paul was only in Thessalonica for three weeks. In Acts 17, when he's in Thessalonica, he sa it says he went in three Sabbath days and reasoned with them out of the scriptures. And then the persecution started with the Jews there, and he had to hightail it to Berea. So he can say this and testify to his labor and travail over only a three-week period, because that's all he was there. And then 1 Thessalonians was written later. He did visit Thessalonica one other time, and not for very long. It's in Acts 20, verses like 1 through 3. It doesn't, Thessalonica isn't even actually mentioned there. But he mentions Macedonia, that he went there, so he probably went to Thessalonica. The point is, he can say this after only three weeks. 2 Thessalonians 3.8, Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. In Acts 20.34, it's in his, uh, Paul's um, teaching to the 
Ephesian believers, the Ephesian leaders. It's a great chapter. In any case, verse 34, Yes, you yourselves know that these hands, referring to his own hands, have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. Not only did he work to support himself, but the people that were traveling with him. And then in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight, 28, besides the other things, what's come upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. So again, Paul freely undertakes one, two, three missionary journeys, right? And then a journey to Rome. In that context, he's always working to support himself. <clears throat> and then uh, I, the, the verse that came to mind to me, and there, I say this because... Um, my personal opinion is that the work ethic has deteriorated in this country a lot. Work is not respected as it used to be. Good, honest, sweat on your brow, work, or video editing that you're truly dedicated to and working at. I mean, it doesn't have to be sweat on your brow stuff, but something that you're focused on and you're consistently trying to do a musician, whatever it is, but good, solid work. Yeah, really. You better watch it, man. But the verse I thought of was Genesis 2.15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. The purpose? To, dread, to tend it and keep it. Right? God put us here for a reason. No disrespect meant to recreation and traveling and all that stuff, but it shouldn't be our mainstay. Why? Because God told us otherwise. And, and it doesn't matter what work it is. It truly doesn't. I thought about that as well because, you know, even menial work. I mean, nowadays in our country, I think it's probably safe to say, too, that um, some types of work are prestigious, some types not so much. Does God look at work that way? You ever think about that? Does God care what you do? doesn't really care. And here's a good example of it. <clears throat> Colossians 3, 22 and 23. Bond servants, this is Paul writing to the Colossian believers. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Now, in our culture, would a servant be prestigious or menial? Not prestigious. And yet, Paul says, don't do it as men pleasers, but serve God from the heart. Work hard. Because your master's in heaven, not because your master's sitting at the table. You don't work because you're working unto some human boss. You're working because you're working unto the Lord. You, you work as unto the Lord. Okay? So if you work as unto the Lord, you don't have to worry about a work ethic. <laughs> I mean, none of us, there's a great verse in 1 John 2.28, uh, and now little children abide in him that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Now, just what that verse says, it's possible to be ashamed because what he says is you walk the talk so that you're not ashamed. So therefore, when Christ returns, when we see him face to face, it's possible to be ashamed. We control whether we are or not. So, um, and that's what Colossians 3, 22 and 23 are talking about as well. Whatever you do, do it heartily. The Greek phrase there, just as a sidelight, means it, it is literally a prepositional phrase. It means out of your soul. That's what heartily means, out of your soul. You should be giving of yourself in your work, whatever that is. If it's a bond servant, if it's a video editing to pick on Matt again, if it's a full-time a full pastor like Nick is, if it's what Tom, an engineer, Mike, a builder, whatever it is, I don't, whatever it is, you should do it heartily, out of your soul, because you're doing it unto the Lord. And the life lesson, to work is a biblical obligation and a privilege. It's always a privilege to work. You know, if you're doing work around the house, <laughs> you know, you got, a di you got a, a sink full of dishes and you got to wash the dishes. Well, there's a couple of perspectives. You can be negative about the fact that you got to wash the dishes or you can be thankful because if you can wash the dishes, then that means you got food, right? Or if you have to sweep your house, you can either be negative about the fact that you got to sweep the house or be thankful that you got a house to sweep or a lawn to mow or whatever it is. 
It depends on perspective. It depends on what filters you bring to what you look at. <clears throat> um, this is just a reminder. I just want to remind you about Timothy. We talked about this in Acts 16, if you were here then. Um, but just a reminder, because not to put, <laughs> I don't want to use too vulgar language here, but Timothy had guts. And you could say that a lot of ways. Timothy had guts. Timothy was probably only about 18 years old at this time, at the time that he was, and this was his first missionary journey, okay? He was a young man. The first time he saw Paul, before Paul came back in Acts 16, a couple of years later, and solicited him to come along with him on a missionary journey, his first encounter with Paul was when Paul was stoned and thrown out of the city. That was missionary work to Timothy. And when Paul came back and asked him, hey, do you want to go? Timothy said, unbelievably, yes. First thing he had to do, as we talked about, was to be circumcised. And just a reminder, I don't think I made a point of this when I taught Acts 16, but Paul did that. It says Paul took and circumcised him. Paul was the one who actually did the circumcision. I don't know if you realize that or not from reading Acts 16, but that is the case. <clears throat> he saw what Paul went through Philippi. Remember when we were looking at the map there, he goes to Philippi. He and Silas get you know, beaten, thrown in prison. Timothy, Timothy and Luke both, actually. Luke's there too. Um, that's one of those we sections we talked about. T Luke is there as well, but Timothy was there the whole time. He you know, goes to Philippi. They leave from Philippi. He's there for Thessalonica for... Um, the persecutions. He actually stays in, stays in Thessalonica. Paul goes to Berea. He then, I think he gets to Berea, sees the persecutions there. Paul leaves. Timothy and Silas stay in Berea. Don't meet Paul until he's in Corinth. We'll read that. It's, you may have noticed that we read it in this chapter. <clears throat> yeah, he was in Thessalonica and Berea both. And you got to think about the fact that Timothy was brought up primarily spiritually by a Jewish mom and a Jewish grandmother. It says that in 1 Timothy. That, um, and Paul describes Timothy's disposition as one of unfeigned faith. Okay? That is to say, pure, not false faith. If Paul the Apostle describes you as being of unfeigned faith, let me tell you that's significant. Okay? So, he describes Timothy that way. So when Timothy gets to Corinth, holy moly, the eyes are about this wide because he hasn't encountered this before. This is the, this is the first time gig for him to be in Corinth. <clears throat> and Timothy again stays with Paul. We won't look at this, but Timothy again stays with Paul unto the, to the very end. You know, the last letter that Paul writes ever is to Timothy. Uh, Timothy, traditionally, this isn't biblical necessarily, I mean, there's not a chapter and verse that is, but Timothy, traditionally, um, continued to oversee the work of the church in Ephesus and was, traditionally, beaten to death in the streets in Ephesus for, Christ, you know, for his stand for Christ. So Timothy was, uh, I just want to, again, point out, Timothy had guts. He was not afraid to hold forth God's word. He was not afraid to go wherever that meant go. He'd, he'd do it. This, uh, you know, when Paul, as his manner is, it says, you know, he went into the synagogue. Paul was a Jew. He's going to try to, and he loved God's people. I mean, you, you read Romans 9 through 11. At one place in there, Paul says, it's the beginning of chapter um, 11, I believe. It says, he says, I could wish myself accursed from Christ for Israel. That is to say, he was willing to, if it were possible, it's not, but he was willing to not be saved if Israel would turn to Christ. He was willing to sacrifice himself to do that. That's what Romans says. That's why, as his manner was, he always went to a synagogue if there was one. Now, many places, there wasn't a synagogue. You know, in uh, where Timothy lived, Lystra, there was no synagogue there. There was a, a requirement under Jewish law that you had to have a certain amount of Jewish men 
in order to have a synagogue at all. If you didn't have that number of Jewish men, you couldn't have a synagogue. In Philippi, when he goes to Philippi, it says there was no synagogue there. It says there was a place where there was prayer, and he talked to the women. There wasn't a big Jewish population in, in Philippi or in Lystra. But many places there was. Corinth, there was, um, there was a, a Jewish synagogue. So he goes into the synagogue. So he speaks to the Jews, Jesus of Christ. The Jews come back, you're crazy, he's not. Okay, so finally, after he's done that for a while, he says, okay, fine. He's, it's, it's a figurative thing in Jewish culture. He shakes his rain and he says, your blood's on your own head. I warned you. I told you. If you don't believe in Christ, that's your problem. You're going to get the consequences of it. And he says, from now on, I go to the Gentiles. Now, that probably is a little bit of a heated remark on Paul's part because he does, in fact, continue to go to the synagogue. When he goes to Ephesus, the very next place, first place he goes to the synagogue. But in this place, it says in Corinth anyway, and maybe that was just local, he's going to go to the Gentiles, right? But that phrase, your blood be on your own head, um, the reason that stood out to me is that biblically, what you're responsible for, what we're responsible for is huge. If you think about the biblical record, even in Genesis, the very first thing that, I won't say the very first thing, one of the first things that God did with man was give him a choice okay do this don't do that if you do that you're gonna die told him what the consequences were but you got the choice right one of the very first things we're talking Genesis 3 here other than creation and naming the animals <laughs> it doesn't get much earlier than that okay so one of the first things is choice so biblically our power to choose is huge God, in his love for us, gave us freedom of will. We get to choose what we eat, what we think, what we say, the friends we have, the mate we pick, etc., etc., etc. You choose, and you live with your choices. In this case, Paul is saying to the Jews, you live with your choices. Your blood's on your own head. If you're not going to be saved and you're not going to be eternally with God, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire, hey, fine, that's your choice. You do that. So, you may know this chapter. It's a great chapter. You ought to read the whole thing sometime. Ezekiel 33, 8. This is God speaking to the prophet, Ezekiel. He says, when I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Why? Because I told you you were the spokesman and you didn't warn him. And that's why Paul says, your blood's on your own head. It's not my responsibility anymore. I spoke. I said what I was supposed to say. Your choice is your choice. <clears throat> in Acts 20, 26, uh, this is Paul again in the speech to the Ephesian leaders. Uh, Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Why does he say that? Very simply, he had given everyone the opportunity to believe in Christ. It was their decision. He didn't hold back. Okay? So he could say, I'm innocent from, uh, your blood's not on my hands. I gave you the opportunity. Romans 14.10, this is a great verse that I personally would encourage you to memorize. Uh, this is not a, you know, a memorization like that Pastor David talks about from the main stage, but this is one that for me is a sobering verse. Um, it's one that helps me to remember that I'm accountable. Um, uh, but why do you judge your brother or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I think the Greek text actually reads God, of God. In any case, whatever it reads, um, the point is we're all going to be standing face to face. Our blood's going to be on our own hands. <laughs> the choices we make, we live with, whatever those choices are. Um, in Colossians 3.23, when uh, Paul talks to the servants and he says, you know, do whatsoever heartily unto the Lord, knowing that uh, the next verse I didn't put on there, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Okay? So that means if they serve heartily, as if they're serving Christ, they get the reward of the inheritance. But if they don't, then there's an alternative to that. Okay? So you live with your choices, whatever those choices are. 
whether it's the character of the work that you do or whether you believe in Jesus Christ or you don't or you choose to, stay, to hang around with idiots that are going to make you get, that are going to uh, have a bad influence on you or you choose to hang around with people who are um, spiritually better, you know, uh, more experienced than you are to bring you up to their level, whatever the, your choices are, you live with those choices. So our blood's on our own head. There was a great phrase. <laughs> And it comes up, actually, Paul says that three different times in the book of Acts about the Jewish people. Three different times he says, your blood's on your own head. I'm going to the Gentiles. He says that finally in Acts 28 when he's in Rome under house arrest, the Jews are coming to him. He's holding forth Christ. They're not believing. They're like these guys, blaspheming and, and talking back. And he says, fine, your blood's on your own head. It's your, it's your responsibility. <clears throat> um, these verses came to mind mainly because of uh, the whole idea of our human lives here, you know, what we do in our everyday lives here, is we really just have an opportunity to steward, whether it's, again, type of work we do, choices we make. We have an opportunity to steward what we have. Whether, again, clothes, job, spouse, kids, we're stewards. I mean, we don't own anything. Have, has anyone ever seen a U-Haul trailer in a cemetery? Have you seen anybody try to take anything with them? There aren't any moving vans there. Nobody's taking anything with them, right? Whatever we have here, we are stewarding. It's, it's going to be gone when we die. When we stand before, according to Romans 14.10, when we stand before the judgment seat of God and we're looking at him face to face, guess what? To, to not put too fine a point on it, you're going to be butt naked. You're not going to have anything at all, except the choices you made and whether those were consistent with the Bible or not. That's all you're going to have. So these verses came to mind because um, Luke 16, 10, just, let's just read them. This is Jesus Christ speaking, of course. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And you, if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Now that last verse, if you think about it, everything we have is another, another beings, another person's, because it's God's. I mean, we don't, have, we don't own anything, right? These verses are great, too, because this is why we do sparkle, right? <laughs> You start off serving in a church, in this church anyway, you start off serving Sparkle. So can you clean a toilet competently? Because if you can, then you're probably a good bet for bigger things because you can do a little thing well. Right? That's what Jesus Christ was talking about. <clears throat> so responsibility. Um, oh, this is again just along the lines of choice. Genesis 3, 9 through 11. Um, then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? By the way, just for your information, first question in the Bible. God asking man where he was. First question in the Bible. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. Adam responds, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God says back and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, and of course, Adam, we'll cover this in a minute. Then the man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Adam did, of course, what any male would do. He blamed the only other two parties available, God and Eve. Right? It was the woman that you gave me. It was her fault. Again, we're responsible for choices. It was because of this choice that sin entered the world. Romans 5 and 6 talk about that. So, a life lesson. We're responsible before God for what we believe and the consequences those beliefs bring with them. And if we have a ministry, a talent, or materials, we are responsible to steward them. If you have a ministry, uh, 2 Timothy, Paul talks about this. Um, yeah, it's right before. Um, 
It's in chapter 4. In 4, 8, I think it is, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Just before that, he says, he encourages Timothy to make full, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, poured out, and the time of my departure is at hand. So Timothy, having that ministry, was responsible to, to steward that. And he, again, traditionally stewarded it to death. The hardest three words in the English language, I am responsible. Hardest three words. We're responsible for our choices. Again, just getting back to that reference by Paul, your blood's on, shook his raiment, your blood's on your own head. So Paul's vision, let's talk about that. It says he had a vision here in Corinth. Okay, so let's just talk about that a little bit. Not, we don't have to do it a lot, but... Um, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. Now this is interesting. You've got to stick with me on this because it gets a touch technical. Okay, a little. Um, the tenses of the Greek verbs, which we're not going to go into specifics of Greek grammar here, but the tenses of the Greek verbs here are important to understand to get an accurate translation of that verse. The accurate translation will show you what Paul was thinking. Why? the Lord Jesus responded with a vision when he was in the middle, when Paul was in the middle of holding forth God's word in Corinth. Okay? The accurate translation is a picture as to what Paul was thinking. So accurately, literally, it says, stop being afraid. Now, what does that mean? That he was. But go on speaking. What does that mean? That he was thinking about stopping. And do not become silent. What does that mean? that he was thinking about becoming silent. Okay, now, it's after this when the record states or records that Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth. But at this time, he was a little afraid. He was starting to think about not speaking. In fact, the Amplified Bible. One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid anymore. That is to say, he was. Stop being afraid. But go on speaking, he was thinking about stopping, and do not be silent. So you can get a picture as to what Paul was thinking. Now this is the great apostle Paul, right, that floated when he put his toga on, his feet were not on the ground. He was levitating, unlike us, so we have to do one leg at a time. Paul floated. No, Paul put on his pants one leg at a time. As great as he was, as much as he did for God, as much as he, the sacrifices he made in Corinth, he was afraid. He was thinking about, you know, maybe I won't talk too much about that anymore. Because that's why he got the vision. That's what that statement says. <clears throat> um, another example of, I'll just call it discouragement in general. I mean, everybody can get discouraged. The strongest believer can get discouraged. I don't know if you've ever read the record of Elijah in the Old Testament and his interaction with Ahab. It's in 1 Kings 17 through 19. If you have not read that, I really encourage you to read it. It is um, gripping and in some places absolutely hilarious. In any case, uh, toward the end of that, uh, after Jezebel threatens to kill him, Jezebel is Ahab's, you know, the Jezebel, like the, the uh, notorious Jezebel, right? Jezebel is Ahab's wife. Okay, so after Jezebel threatens to kill him, Elijah says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die, and said, it's enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. And this is after this guy uh, did unbelievable things. Again, I won't relate all those things in the record. I do encourage you to read that, 1 Kings 17 through 19. So even the strongest believers can get discouraged you're going to get discouraged. If Elijah, if Paul got discouraged, let me clue you in on something. You're going to get discouraged. Okay. Life lesson, the best spokesman for Christ, the most fervent Christian believer can become afraid and discouraged. And just as the Lord Jesus uh, was there for Paul in Corinth, the Lord will be with you as well to encourage you. It might be something you read in God's Word. It might be a friend. Christian friend who encourages you. I don't know what, the, it might be your, your spouse, your mate, 
I don't know what the avenue would be, but God will be there to encourage you. And then Paul's response to the vision. So, you know, that vision says, um, stop, you know, don't be silent. Don't, don't be afraid. Stop being afraid. Don't start to be silent. And Paul's response to that, because again, Paul could respond. I mean, he could continue to feel the way that that statement indicates he felt, that he was afraid, that he wanted to stop speaking. He could continue to do that. But his response was Acts 18, 11, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So, and um, again, just sort of as a sidelight, remember that at this time in New Testament history, there wasn't anything written down. The Gospels weren't written. The only epistles written uh, later in the, third, the second missionary journey was First and Second Thessalonians. That was the only written part of the New Testament there. So when it says he was teaching the Word of God, he's just teaching the Word of God. It's not like he's opening a Bible and showing them chapter and verse because there wasn't a Bible. The Old Testament, old Hebrew Scriptures, but not New Testament Scriptures. <clears throat> um, just in one other point on, this, on Paul's vision. The Greek word here for vision is, if you want to know the Greek word, it's horama. It's how you pronounce it. It's not a dream, it is a vision. In other words, the individual is awake. You know, maybe you might refer to it as a trance-like state. You're not sleeping, which is when you have a dream. You are awake when you have a vision. Okay, so these visions are described in the New Testament under, in certain situations, like Moses in the burning bush is referred to in Acts 7 by Stephen as, you know, Moses looking at seeing a vision. The vision to Ananias when he was going to go, when Jesus was going to send him to save Paul. That was a vision. Paul's vision on the road to Damascus when Jesus appears to him. Peter's vision about the Gentiles. Paul's vision of the man of Macedonia when he goes to Philippi. And then this vision in Corinth. Those are the only visions talked about in the New Testament. As opposed to that, the Greek word onar is the word for dream. Now, there aren't many places in the New Testament where dreams are ever used by God to communicate guidance. The only instances are when um, God tells Joseph what to do with Mary and Jesus, you know, go here, go there, go wherever it is, to avoid the persecutions that are coming. The only other dream mentioned in the New Testament that was, uh, I guess, maybe divine guidance, you'd call it, was to Pontius Pilate's wife when Jesus was condemned. And she said, I've suffered many things of, of this man in a dream. Those are the only dreams referred to as conveying guidance. Now, the only reason I bring that up is I'm not saying God cannot guide you by a dream, but I will say that it would probably be by far the exception. Most of our guidance, day to day, what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to live, et cetera, et cetera, is going to come from the written revelation of God's word. I'm not saying there aren't other means. Clearly, God is not limited to how he communicates with you. However, it would be exceptional if it were a dream. Okay, so just wanted to make that point. So Paul spends 18 months in Corinth. Corinth. Um, just mention a couple of things. That was the longest time he spent any one place except in Ephesus. He was in Ephesus for two years and three months, right? In Corinth, he was there a year and a half. Now, some places, in contrast, Philippi was relatively short. Thessalonica, as I mentioned, was three weeks. He was there three weeks. He stopped in a little later. There's no other recorded visit. Two letters to him. That's it. Nothing else. Corinth, he was there a year and a half. Two long epistles, right? First and Second Corinthians are some of the longer books in the Bible. <clears throat> So let's think about the character of the Corinthian church as evidenced by what's in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Okay? So they're referred to by Paul as babes in Christ. Now after a year and a half teaching the word of God among them, you'd think they might not be babes. He was in Thessalonica three weeks, and he refers to those guys as killing it, just knocking Homer spiritually. But Corinth, not so much. He, they question Paul's apostleship and authority. You can look up these references. We're not going to actually look at these verses if you want, uh, or, but if you want to, you can. Um, there was fornication going on openly. It's referred to in 1 Corinthians 5.1. They were bringing lawsuits, believer against believer. They were suing each other. That's in 1 Corinthians 6. Right? 
Um, they question Paul's right to live of the gospel, that is to say, take contributions uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, 7. They misuse the manifestations of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, three chapters devoted to trying to correct what they were doing. That's in no other book of the Bible but Corinthians. They were already, interestingly, they were already teaching error about the resurrection. If you look in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, if Christ, you know, if Christ was raised from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So already there was doctrinal error. As of like 51 AD, 20 years after Jesus um, was raised from the dead and ascended, 20 years later, there is no resurrection in Corinth. <laughs> According to 1 Corinthians 15, that was going around, which is why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15 in the first place. Interestingly, if you contrast 1 Corinthians 15, it's 51 through 58, that actually talks about the return of Christ. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 talks about it with 1 Thessalonians. But what's interesting is, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul starts out, what are you talking about there's no resurrection? And he proceeds to instruct them, right? In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, remember he was there three weeks. The passage starts out by saying, now brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant about them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. Paul simply hadn't taught them. That's why he wrote 1 Corinthians 4, 13 through 18. It's not because they were doubting that Jesus was coming or that there was a resurrection at all. It was because he hadn't had time to teach them all this stuff. In Corinth, he had the time, and he did it, and he had to correct it. There was no follow-through on financial giving. At one point, you can, again, look at this. It's in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. But uh, the Corinthians kind of talked about financial giving to the church in Jerusalem. And he talks about the fact that, you know, you promised this a year ago, and now perform the doing of it. They just, they don't follow through on it, even though they said they're going to do it. And Paul's time, as in contrast to Thessalonica, he was there for three weeks, there was a second visit, but the character of the Thessalonian church really is best capsulized in one verse, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually works in you who believe. Now what's the difference? The Corinthians received what he said as the word of men. No believing. The Thessalonians received it as the word of God. We believe you. Look at the difference. So, again, that's just a lesson for us. You know, when we read God's word, we have to bring ourselves up to the level of God's word. It is always God's word. When you sit down to read the Bible, you're not just reading a book. You are reading God's word. You have to elevate yourself to that level. You have to bring yourself up to that level. <clears throat> And then the, uh, Gallio, this is, this is interesting because it testifies to Luke's accuracy. Acts 18, 12, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. There were, uh, there's one of the ways that the things in you know, New Testament history is sort of verified or not, or one of the things that contributes to historical knowledge is things called inscriptions, right? So from three different inscriptions, they can kind of nail down pretty well when Gallio was actually the proconsul of Achaia. First of all, he was. Second of all, they can nail it down to that he started probably in May or June of 51 AD, which means that that coincides very well with what we talked about with Paul's second missionary journey, 49 to 51. So the point being, Luke is accurate. The detail when, when God's word talks historically, it's accurate. The other thing interesting about Gallio is that there were two different Roman writers, a fellow called Statius and Seneca, that described Gallio, literally described Gallio as sweet. They used the Latin word dulcus, which usually means like sweet or pleasant, right? So anyway, when, so when the Jews bring Paul, Gallio just interrupts him and says, wait a minute, if this is about your laws, forget about it and get out of here. That was very unlike Gallio. That wasn't characteristic of his rule, but with the Jews, Remember, not that long before, they had been expelled from Rome. Gallio just does the same thing. Get out. You're out of here. But that wasn't his nature. That wasn't his reputation. 
<clears throat> and very simply, God's word is accurate. Um, many, many things that Paul talks about in Luke and Acts as a specific biblical writer that are historical. All of them are historically accurate. And we find that out as we find more uh, detail historically. And then Paul's persecuted by the Jews. Um, if you read through the records, that happened at Damascus. When he first preached at Damascus after he was converted, one of the first things there was the Jews tried to kill him. He had to hightail it out of Damascus. Happened at Jerusalem. He, was, he had to go to Rome to be in, ultimately in prison because he appealed to Caesar because of the charges the Jews brought against him in Jerusalem in Acts 21. That was the fourth journey he made all the way to Rome. It was because of the Jews and the persecution and him appealing to Caesar because he was a Roman citizen. It happened in Antioch of Pisidia, in Iconium, at Lystra, Derbe, Thessalonica, Berea. Paul's response to all of this in Acts 18:18. 18, 18, so Paul still remained a good while. You know, I think of that record in uh, when Timothy first saw Paul in the fir during the first missionary journey. And it's outside of Lystra, and, you know, the, the people come out because Paul heals somebody. The people come out and say, whoa, Jupiter and Mercury, we're going to worship you. And they bring out sacrifices, right? And Paul, says, Paul and Barnabas both say, wait a minute, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. And so they stop them, but then the Jews, again, they stone them. They drag them outside the city. The next verse is truly incredible because it says he gets up and he goes back in the city. Paul's response to this was, okay, persecution? I'll spend a little more time here. You see it again and again. He was an amazing guy, uh, an amazing man in whom Christ could work. Um, the third missionary journey, you... The little, there's a little blurb here, very little blurb here. In fact, you kind of miss it if you don't sort of look for it. It's in verse 22, 1822. And when Paul had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. Okay? Antioch of Syria. There's an Antioch of Pisidia over there. But Antioch of Syria is where he started the first missionary journey, the second missionary journey, and now the third missionary journey. 1822, he comes to Antioch. That's where the second missionary journey ends. 1823, it says he starts to go from Antioch up through Galatia in, in, in chapter 18 and only goes through like Galatia and Phrygia, right up in here. Okay? But that 1822 is the end of the second missionary journey. 1823 is the beginning of the third missionary journey, which happens, again, 52 to 57. You can see there wasn't much of a lapse 49 to 51 was the first missionary journey. He stays a little time in Antioch, and then he hightails it again for a much longer journey. So it takes four years. He's, this is the one where in Ephesus, he's there for two years and three months, right? So he's gone for like four years plus. He goes another 2,500 miles, half and half by land and by sea. So for the third missionary journey, and he ends up, and at the end of this journey is when he's down here, the Jews try to persecute him, imprison him, and that's when the whole journey to Rome starts. Several imprisonments, et cetera, et cetera, leading up to the end of the book of Acts. <clears throat> so, um, I just want to mention about Apollos, Aquila, and Priscilla. You may remember Apollos was, you know, mighty, it says he was mighty in the scriptures, but he only knew the baptism of John. Indicate, first of all, he's described as a Jew, probably wasn't a Christian, probably didn't know about Christ or hadn't come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Apollos, or uh, um, Aquila, kind of take him aside, teach him further. He comes to a saving knowledge, right? <clears throat> and it's really Acts 1-5, John truly baptized with water, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence, not many days from now. The fact that Apollos, being mighty in Scripture, was humble enough to even listen to these guys, <laughs> who themselves were only fairly new believers, because remember, Aquila was a Jew. Here, his, uh, Quill and Priscilla's encounter with Paul was when they became Christians. But at the beginning of this chapter, they weren't Christians themselves. Okay? But they were with Paul those 18 months while he was teaching the word, and apparently they learned their lessons well. So they expound to Apollos, and he actually listens. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And... Um, just, again, a reminder, the quote-unquote doctrine available to them at this time, there was nothing in writing. 
The only parts of the New Testament written at this time were 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. That's it. Nothing else was written. So, and those wouldn't necessarily have been available to them because obviously the first place they're going to go is Thessalonica, right? Paul's letters after their original destination were circulated and or copied so other churches read them. But initially, I mean, that would take time. So it's not like Aquila and Priscilla had anything, okay, now, Apollos, sit down here. I want you to read this. No, they didn't have that. None of that was written. Only, again, Hebrew scriptures, but nothing in the New Testament. Um, and along the line of um, when this is, you know, this arrow again is like first century. It's the progression of, really, it's the progression of how the rise and expansion of the Christian church, beginning with Christ's um, death and resurrection. And then we're, we just finished uh, this journey, 29 to 51. Okay, and now we're down starting this one, Paul's third trip. During that time, first and second Thessalonians are written during that second trip, during the third trip. Romans, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, those epistles are written. But again, this is just the progress, the rise and expansion of the Christian church as Christ works into believers and those believers respond to that working, just like we do every day. As God works in you to speak, to teach, to share, to whatever, to work, to, to financially give, to serve in the church, that's just like what these guys did. I mean, it isn't written in the Bible, maybe, but remember, bond servants are, have the inheritance too if they serve the Lord Christ heartily. So do we. Same thing. It's no different. And I think that's it. So I'll close with prayer. If you do have questions or comments, you're welcome to make them. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the time we've had to study your word. We thank you so much for recording this written record for us that we can um, incorporate it into our lives, that we can live our lives accordingly, that we do have the power to choose, that we have the opportunity in your word to see both good and bad choices and what those consequences were. Thank you so much for the men and women of God who have stood uh, over the centuries to bring your word to us, to be examples for us. Thank you so very much again for these men, for their choosing to be here for their choosing to make your word a priority in their lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.